raising taxes is really, really easy. It's not difficult. The only thing making it difficult is the political constraints, as we said at the top, right? So if Rachel Reeves hadn't constrained herself and she wanted to raise billions, then look, we spend, I don't know, 70 billion on VAT relief, you could scrap those, put a few pennies on income tax, you got 20 billion quite quickly, put a penny, couple of pennies on VAT, another 10 billion. You could actually quite quickly get loads of billions. So we, it's not that raising tax is difficult. It's that if you say you're not going to raise most of the tax system, then you're scraping around the barrel. That's what's difficult. Hello and welcome to the IFS Zooms In. I'm Paul Johnson, Director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Now, over the summer, we're bringing you a series of briefings on some of the key challenges and policy options facing the new set of government ministers. And today we're turning to possibly the biggest of the challenges, the tax system. And in particular, we're going to be looking at the sorts of questions the Chancellor has Almost certainly, well, in fact, I think because they certainly been asking Treasury officials in recent weeks, how could she get more tax revenue and how could tax reform boost growth? I think that's <laughs> certainly in the in the fiscal world, the question on everybody's lips, what taxes are going to rise? So to tackle those questions, I'm joined by the fantastic Dan Needle, a tax lawyer and founder of Tax Policy Associates, and by Helen Miller, Deputy Director here at the IFS and Head of our Tax Work. There are probably no two better qualified people in the country to talk about this subject. Now, the background, of course, is that uh, Rachel Reeves was absolutely adamant during the election campaign that her plans wouldn't require tax rises other than the handful of small measures set out in the manifesto. And they really are very small taxes on private schools, some changes to non-DOM rules and so on. But since then, she's carried out the so-called spending audit in which she's claimed that the public finances are in an even worse state than expected and mean that she's now looking at tax rises in the autumn budget. Well, let's pass swiftly on the idea that this wasn't known, broadly speaking, at the time of the election. We and others pointed out It was very, very clear uh, that unless you were happy to have some spending cuts, tax rises were almost certain to happen in the first budget. And I think we can now say they are even more almost certain to happen. So what sort of things is she likely to do? Whether this was always part of the plan or not, we don't know. But you can tell very clearly with the speech that Keir Starmer has made this week that the tone has rather changed in the run-up to the election. Very, very clear. Tax increases weren't going to be needed. We were going to get growth and we'll be fine. Uh, Post-election, all much more difficult than we thought. Everything's a mess. Things are going to get worse before they get better. And that probably means tax increases. I'll pass swiftly on the irritation that that creates in me, given uh, the clarity uh, before the election that this was likely to be needed. But let's move on to this issue of what's likely to happen to taxes. And perhaps the first thing to say, Helen, is that there is one set of tax rises, or possibly two, which are absolutely nailed on. Yep. So I think the context here, there's a, in the bigger context even than the, the tax rises, that we already had big tax rises in recent years. So tax, the share of GDP has already gone up quite a lot. So tax in the UK as a share of national income has never, never, never really been higher on a sustained basis. So that's kind of the important context. Um, personal tax thresholds are still frozen and due to be frozen for another three years, and that's a tax rise. So there's about another 10 billion of tax rises working their way through the system across the next few years. So even if Rachel Reeves does nothing, uh, those are unless she cancels them, those are due to go ahead. The other thing that's a bit different, but that, that's current, at least in the OBR numbers, is that fuel duty is due to both rise in line with inflation and the temporary 5p cut that's currently in place is due to expire. So Rachel Reeves doesn't have to do anything for that to happen. Um, but if she doesn't want that to happen, and they haven't had, you know, fuel duty hasn't gone up in line with inflation since 2010, then she would have to find money to pay for those. So um, they're in the full costs, um, and she could just let them happen. That would be, you know, one thing to do. But if she wants to stop them the way the Conservative government was stopping them, then she'd need to find some cash. So she'd need to find some money just to undo something that's in the forecast. That freezing of personal allowance is really important. Neither party wanted to talk about it in the run up to the election, but both parties seem to have accepted that this, as you say, £10 billion tax rise, which will affect um, most income tax payers, will happen. And that is a substantial tax increase following several years of um, freezes to these allowances and thresholds. It's worth saying, in addition, Helen, your 
you're absolutely right that the tax burden as a whole is at its highest level essentially ever. But it's quite remarkable, isn't it, that that is in the context of people on average sorts of earnings, actually in terms of their direct taxes, paying less than they have in 50 years. Yeah, we talked about this in detail on the previous podcast. Yeah, the basically it's been an increase in the tax burden overall, but it's kind of a change in the composition. So that for av- at least on their direct taxes, average earners are now paying uh, less, but we're paying more in other taxes um, and higher earners are paying more. So yeah, change both in the overall level and in the composition of tax revenues. It's one of these developments that no one wants to talk about because it's embar- embarrassing for all political parties. The Tories have presided over a system where the increases in taxes have disproportionately been borne by the wealthy. The Tories are kind of embarrassed about that. Labour kind of doesn't want to admit that, but it's nevertheless the truth. Yeah, it's quite remarkable. It's sort of uh, you know, a couple of months ago, I would tend to go around saying, this Tory government... It's really hitting the wealthy and it's hit big companies really quite hard, uh, which is not part of the narrative, as you say, that either side wanted to talk about. But it also, Dan, makes life a bit difficult for the new government because they're presumably not going to want to increase. Well, I've said they don't want to increase taxes on working people. You know, that is a pretty strange thing to say because it's I, I frankly can't think of any tax that doesn't affect working people. But let's take them. Let's take that phrase. Uh, I, one assumes that means they don't want to increase taxes on people on average sorts of earnings. That really does leave things like companies and people with lots of income or wealth, where, as we've said, the increases have been the biggest over the last 15 years. Yes, they've said they don't want to, they don't want to increase taxes on normal working people. They've said they won't introduce a wealth tax. They've said no increase in corporation tax, no increase in income tax rates, no increase in national insurance rates, no increase in VAT. That together covers about 80-85% of the entire tax system. It's not leaving much room for tax increases. It does really constrain them. Uh, Exactly what they mean by no increases in income tax and so on, we can uh, explore. Um, But what's left? I mean, if if you are, I mean, let's assume that they're looking for a good £20 billion of additional tax revenues. Now, that is actually roughly the scale of the national insurance cut introduced by Jeremy Hunt. I think rather cynically, given the situation in the public finances, um, he knew that that would be very difficult to afford given the public finance rules. Uh, and the politics, I mean, the Labour Party, in a sense, went along with it. They uh, agreed with it. They voted for it. And they've said they won't undo it. So in that sense, they've left themselves with this much bigger, difficult situation on tax than they needed to have. Uh, but let's suppose you wanted that £20 billion, um, or so my view, frankly, is that the easiest way to get that £20 billion back would be to put 3p on the main rates of income tax, um, certainly on the basic rate. That would be a better world than the higher rate of national insurance. Uh, it would get you the money back. But of course, it would break that manifesto pledge. I think that's extremely unlikely. Although, as Dan pointed out uh, in our pre-discussion back in 2010, David Cameron was very clear that he had no plans to increase VAT. And then there was a big increase in VAT immediately after the election. So it's not impossible that some of these pledges will be ignored. But given the clarity that Rachel Rees in particular has uh, used in her wording that this won't happen, I think we can assume that it probably uh, won't. So so what's left? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's worth like it is worth bearing in mind that these constraints are political, right? I mean, I think I get asked all the time is exactly what's left. And I think it depends a bit on how strictly you interpret their pledges. If you just take the manifesto pledges, and you just think, okay, they're ruling out uh, national insurance contributions, VAT, and their wording of their commitment was the basic higher and additional rate of income tax. That would leave some thresholds and other things. If you just take that, it is a bit less restrictive than if you take some of the things that are trading in the media about no council tax, no wealth tax, as Dan was saying. So I think these are political constraints. Ultimately, they have to decide exactly what they want to do. And are they willing to break a constraint? Are they willing to you know, manipulate something? But if you rule out the big three, the big three, then basically, I think, and we can work through the details, I think you're left with sort of three things you can do. You can do substantial reform to pensions. You can do substantial reform to CGT. Sorry, capital gains tax, yeah. Or you can do lots of little things across the tax system, you know, tweaking reliefs and rates, and you can get, you know, uh, a few hundred million here and there, and they can add up. If you do enough of them, you can add up something substantial. But I think there's no there's no sort of single rate you can just move that instantly gets you the 20 billion in the way that, as you were saying, Paul, if you did the 3p on income tax, you'd get something like that. So... We can go through those options, but they're going to have to be scraping around in the barrel, basically, to do lots of little things that, that could add up to something substantial. They're not going to have to just press a button and get 20 billion rolling through the door. Uh, you got any better ideas than that, Dan? 
I went on, am I allowed to talk about other podcasts? I went on a certain other podcast and I said, gosh, it's going to be really, really hard to find 20, 22 billion just by scrabbling around with little changes here and there. And then I locked myself in a cupboard for a couple of days and came up with a succession of tiny tweaks that added up to 22 billion. But I cheated because a lot of that came from pensions reform. And if you don't touch pensions, it's really quite hard to raise that kind of money. Yeah. So should we work through pensions? I mean, pensions is an interesting one, right? Because... I'm sure, as we say at the top, you know, Rachel Rees will ask her officials, where can I get this money? And pensions relief will be on the list because we spend a really big chunk of money, at least the way the government counts it, on upfront relief for pensions. People put money in their pensions, they get upfront relief from income tax on that um, pensioning, uh, pension contribution and usually upfront uh, national insurance contribution relief. So that's a big chunky relief. And it is true that if you capped that relief, you could raise um, quite a lot of money. So if you capped that relief at, say, the basic rate, so you didn't let high rate taxpayers get their full relief for their contribution, you only gave them relief at 20%, you'd get something like 15 billion. So there is a chunky tax rise. And what we'd say is that, at least what I would say, is that's not a very good idea. I mean, you, you want a consistent way of treating pension savings. The broad notion that you don't get taxed on the way in and you do get taxed on the way out, I think is a sensible one. So for my money, I wouldn't start fiddling, fiddling with the upfront reliefs, even though it's the quickest and easiest probably way to, to get big money. I guess I'll park the issue of defined benefit pensions, which that make it a bit more difficult. But I think that's the quickest way to get money. What you could do instead is, and we've written lots and lots about this, is think about changing the way you tax pension income on the way out. So you could look at the lump sum tax-free, the 25% tax-free that people can take. You could cap or reduce that. Or you could start thinking about national insurance contributions. I think if you want to get big money without changing up front reliefs, it's national insurance contributions you need to look at on the basis that a lot of pension income escapes national insurance entirely. So it never gets paid on the way in or the way out. And therefore you could you could change that. But, but that, that would be a big chunky reform. And it, it probably would break the pledge of no increase in national insurance depending on how you raise it. But I don't think, unless you do that mucking around with that front release, which I don't like, I think you'd have to do something quite substantial to get, you know, more than a couple of billion. So I think it would be, yeah. George Osborne, um, I remember, toyed with the idea of moving the relief on pensions entirely and changing the taxation of pensions to something more like an ISA system, um, individual savings account, where you pay tax in the normal way on your income when you earn it and put it in, and then it's tax-free on the way out. And that would get you a lot of money up front. Up front, it would, yeah. Uh, but it has, I think, two disadvantages. One is that it means it reduces your uh, uh, tax revenues later on when people are pensioners, and that's when you need the money. And secondly, you really do have to trust the government not to change the tax system again and tax it on the way out when they see in 30 years' time there's all this tax-free money coming out of pensions and all there's some money to get hold of. And I think I'd be quite nervous um, as a citizen um, about that. But it, it's going to be it, it, that sort of thing today, given the uh, given the constraints on the public finances, might well look quite attractive, although uh, politically it might be quite difficult. I mean, Dan, what's your view on um, pensions taxation? I mean, I am not a pension tax specialist. And when I and other people who aren't specialists come up with thoughts, we tend to be met by wailing and gnashing of teeth from people who are <laughs> pension specialists who will point out things like, how do you deal with the transition? So, all right, we're, we're going to change it. So instead of being tax relief in, tax out, it's going to be no tax relief in and non tax out. But that means everyone's now going to have to have two pensions, the old style one and the new style one. Gosh, that's going to be complicated. What about defined benefit pensions, which currently get a very sweet deal in tax terms compared with normal defined contribution pensions. And it becomes murky and difficult. What does murky and difficult mean in tax terms? First of all, it means that the revenues are often not quite as big as you'd think when you just score the numbers on the board. Second, it creates uncertainty and complexity, which tends to be bad for good people, but good for bad people because it means we will see shysters selling schemes that try and take advantage of them. So the complexity of a proposal is, I think, a problem for the proposal. But there are, being thinking of our list of small things, there are a bunch of things that they could start doing that would at least start filling up the numbers, right? So they toy with the idea of uh, reintroducing a lifetime cap on, on pensions. They sort of dropped that, but we're not, I don't know whether it had properly dropped or whether it could re-emerge again. They could put some kind of lifetime limit on pensions or they could put a more sensible version of that on it. So they could cap, rather than cap the total amount of money in a pot, they could cap the tax relief you can get within a pension vehicle or they could readjust the, the lump, the 25% tax-free. So don't remove it completely, but 
uh, readjust it and take away some benefits for you know those with really big pension pots. Um, they could they could and should put pensions within inheritance tax. So that, you know at the moment it's kind of scandalous that you can avoid inheritance tax by uh, passing on a pension. So none of those things would get you tons of billions on their own. But again, if you start doing lots of these little things, you can add up the hundreds of millions and you start to get some some billions. But um, so I think there are things. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw something on pensions in the in the budget. I, I love Dan's way of looking at this. That, that that increases complexity, which is bad for good people and good for bad people. It's a nice way of thinking. Quite a lot about um, a lot of the additional complexity that we've had in uh, the tax system um, over time. So, uh, I, I think our conclusion is you might be able to get significant money from changing pensions relief, but that would be quite. It wouldn't actually be a good idea, sort of economically, if you just did that by reducing pension tax relief on the way in. It'd be really quite complicated, particularly for those people currently in defined benefit schemes. And you know, there are some tweaks that you want to, you might want to make in terms of inheritance tax and uh, tax free lump sums. They'll get you a bit of money, but uh, particularly for the tax free lump sum, that's something you need to phase in over time because some people are reliant on that and it build up over time. But it's not not big money unless you're going to do something really radical and complicated. Yeah. And just, I mean, just to add to your recap, I think national insurance is an issue here. This form of income often escapes national insurance entirely. I think it'd be great to see them start to put some national insurance on pension income and or to put that, you know, put national put employer national insurance contribution on pensions on the way in. I think there could be good things to say about both of those, but but that'd be bold, right? Both in general for a government but also minister, for yes. a government that's just been made a big fuss about not increasing national insurance contributions. So uh, it doesn't mean I can't do it, but it would need to be a big a big thing. You need to spend some political capital on it for sure. And so without even trying, we're back to tax reform. The answer to so many problems in tax is to scrap national insurance and roll it into income tax. And among the many problems it solves is this one. Yeah. And just so people are clear what the problem is here, if, you're, if your employer puts money into a pension on your behalf, there are no national insurance contributions paid on that money at all. Um, and then, uh, of course, when you take it out, there are no national insurance contributions on the money as it comes out. So it's from that part of the tax system, which, remember, is a big part of the tax system, the national insurance, it is entirely tax-free, that savings. That's much more generous than even the income tax uh, treatment of pensions, which is itself uh, pretty um, generous. But uh, you know, either to, I mean, to start charging national insurance on pensions in payment, um, which I think is a good case for doing, at least at a reduced rate, politically very bold, um, and you will get every pension company and employer in the country up in arms if you try and get them to put um, national insurance contributions on the money that they're putting into pensions. So again, that would be really quite bold. So um, some things there on the pension side, but it's going to be a tricky one if the Chancellor wants to get lots of money from there. The other thing, uh, Dan, that people are talking about a lot is capital gains tax, at least in our sort of slightly sad, nerdy world. They're talking a lot about... Uh, I, I resent that, Paul. Yeah, I love I love I love our little nerdy world. Oh, so do I. So do I. Um, it's uh, I I I I I'd struggle to get out of a sad nerdy world. But anyway, it's a happy nerdy <laughs> it's world. A happy, it, it is a happy nerdy world on the inside, <laughs> <laughs> whatever it looks like from the outside. But capital gains tax, Dan. So in the election, we had two political parties, the Lib Dems and the Greens, saying that they would equalise the rates of capital gains tax and income tax. The Lib Dems said this would raise five billion pounds. Slight problem with that. HMRC published this helpful ready reckoner showing their estimates of the revenue cost or yield from adjusting tax rates and thresholds. And anyone can Google that online. If you look at what happens if you raise the higher rate of CGT and equalise it, you see you don't get five billion of revenue at all. You lose about two billion. Now, whether that's correct or not, you you can certainly argue. But on the face of the only public figures that are out there equalising rates is a dangerous move. Why do you lose money if you increase the rate? Why, why do you lose money? So we, we all need income. We, 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 we need it to eat. Most people can't control their income. They're paid regular salaries. Capital gains is different. You pay capital gains tax if you sell stuff. You don't have to sell stuff. If I'm a landlord with a house and it's sitting on a bit of gain, if I sell it, there's going to be a capital gain. I could sell it today with the rates at um, for, for real estate 24%, I think. They just changed. I may be wrong on that. Or I can wait. And if the rates suddenly go up a lot, well, I may think, these rates, they're high. I'm not going to sell now. I'm going to wait till they come down again. So I'm controlling the timing at which I pay the tax, and that reduces the revenue. You see the opposite effect too. 
if I'm sitting on some shares that have massively gone up in value, and I think the government's about to increase the rate of capital gains tax, why I'll sell the shares today. I'll lock in the current very low 20% rate of capital gains on shares rather than paying some higher rate in the future. So those two effects, accelerating when you sell and deferring when you sell, make playing around with the capital gains tax rate a difficult and dangerous thing. Well, I think it's worth, I agree with, I agree with that. I think it's one, actually one of a case where I think the government would be better to do more. So I think if you just fiddle around with the rates, they're actually now, the capital gains tax is a mess. There are lots of different rates depending on what kind of assets you're selling. Um, and if you just tweak the rates, then you don't get a lot of money. I think we're a bit more optimistic than the government about the ready reckoner figures that Dan's talking about. Um, I don't think capital days are quite as responsive as the government. I think you'd raise a bit more money than the ready reckoner uh, suggests. But but we're, we're quite quibbling here about degrees. I mean, I think it's still the case that certainly if you whacked up the capital gains tax rate to income tax rates, I don't think you're going to get the kind of money that people are, people are hoping for. Um, but I think if you did a broader set of reforms, you could ironically maybe get more money. I think a good way of thinking about that, one example of that is we currently don't tax capital gains at death. Um, so, you know, you have an asset, it's resident value, you die and pass that asset on. Um, those gains basically get forgiven, they get they get untaxed. So if, for example, you put up rates quite a lot, more people would delay either, I don't know the way I think Dan was talking about, delay until a new government comes in and drops the rate again, or just delay and make that part of their bequest. And for normal people, we can't do that. But for other people who have got big portfolios of different kinds of assets, they can decide to do that. So that's one example where just tweaking a rate wouldn't work. Um, there are other sort of economic problems with capital gains and the way it's designed, which boil down to the fact that we, um, the way we tax gains, basically the tax base, means that, for example, we tax pure inflationary gains. If you hold an asset, inflation's high, you have some inflationary gains, we tax that. Um, and that, you know, that and other things just end up discouraging investment. So... I think CGT is a mess. Capital gains tax is a mess. I would love to see the government tackle this properly, but I think just tweaking rates for easy money isn't going to get them very much. What they'd need to do is look properly at the tax base, at a whole set of reliefs. Some of them need to be less generous. Some of them need to be more generous. So basically, if you put money into an asset, I think you should get relief on that money. But we shouldn't be having special reliefs for business assets or um, or dying or anything like that. So a more sensible base, then I think you could raise rates Um and I think you'd get more money and it'd be a, it'd be a better system. Of course, you also have to keep an eye on other taxes. So, you know, when people are thinking about different incomes. They're thinking not just about capital gains, but also dividend taxes and saving taxes and income. So you'd want to think about your whole range of taxes and how people can switch across different tax bases. But a big picture for people who aren't in our happy, nerdy world. Yeah, I think see, capital gains tax is a mess. Rachel Reeves would be mad not to be looking at that part of tax because it's, it's you know, distorting all sorts of decisions in a not very good way. I think... Proper reforms would be good, both for revenue and fairness. I mean, lots of gains we haven't mentioned. The taxable gains are very heavily concentrated atop the income distribution. So the fact that they're taxed at much lower rates than uh, labour income, than salaries, means that basically big tax breaks are going to you know, the very richest people. Um, and it means that you know there might be two people, maybe you've got capital gains, Paul and I haven't, but we're very similar otherwise, and you get a lower tax just because you can take your income in capital gains. There's also horizontal inequity. So loads of reasons to fix capital gains. But I think they'd need to make the tax base as well as the rates, um, and start. You know, then I think you could, get, you know, you could start getting a few billion, maybe you know, maybe high single digit billions out of capital gains if you did a proper package of reforms. But as Dan was saying, not if you just tweak with some rates. So uh, a, a complicated thing, something that needs sorting, but it needs sorting with a view to making the tax better, as uh, as it were, a path to also getting some more money from it but we're not talking anything even you know, remotely approaching the sort of 20 billion pounds that uh, that, that perhaps racial reeves needs uh, dan you mentioned that you shut yourself in a cupboard for several days um and come up with a whole bunch of on top of the pension ideas what, what other sort of smaller ideas did you have for raising money so some of them involve closing loopholes in existing taxes so inheritance tax is the most loophole written tax you can see charts of the effective rate of inheritance tax paid by estates of different sizes. And as the estate value goes over about £5 million, the effective rate falls. And that's because it becomes easier for people to take advantage of the overgenerous reliefs and loopholes. Those could be capped. That could raise a couple of billion. So that is inheritance tax is definitely a target here. Um, other loopholes, my favourite loophole is the commercial stamp duty loophole. If you buy a building, a commercial building, you're supposed to pay stamp duty land tax on that at 5%. So 
so nobody does that. Almost all high-value real estate is held in special-purpose companies, often offshore companies. And when someone buys a special-purpose company that's offshore, you don't pay stamp duty at all. Back when we were in the EU, there were some EU law reasons why fixing that was quite hard. Those don't apply anymore. We already have rules that identify and tax somewhat differently companies holding real estate in that way. It would be technically pretty easy to apply stamp duty to them. And that could raise really quite a lot of money. Do we think that's a good idea, though? I mean, we don't like stamp duty very much. I mean, No, it's rubbish. I hate stamp duty. <laughs> so I, I'd much rather abolish stamp duty altogether and have an annual land tax. But uh, whatever we do should be consistent. We're better off having a bad tax that applies to everyone fairly than a bad tax with enormous loopholes. I guess ideally you might think about getting rid of that loophole and then dropping the rates of stamp duty to, you know, if you're going to spend that money, spend it through lower rates rather than through the loophole. In other times, that, 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 that would happen. So I, I fear at the moment every possible tax rise has one purpose ending, and that's to raise revenue. Yeah. But I mean, they're quite encouraging in, in a way. There's a couple of reasonably significant loopholes, as you described them, that, um, that could be closed uh, and make the tax system at least fairer, even if, um, even if uh, particularly when it comes to stamp duty, I mean, overall, I think all of us in this room would rather abolish the whole blooming thing because it's an unbelievably damaging uh, tax. Um, um, so perhaps we could. Um, so, so in, in a sense, we, we I mean, we're struggling, aren't we? I mean, we're, we're we're genuinely struggling to come up with significant amounts of money given the constraints that the government's put itself um, under. If you're really not going to raise rates of income tax, national insurance, corporation tax. Uh, and VAT, you can mess around with the um, uh, pension tax system, quite likely making it worse if you're getting lots of money from it. You need a serious reform of capital gains tax if you're going to get more money from that. You're not just increasing uh, rates. Um, there are some loopholes to to, to 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 close, which might get you some um, uh, some money. Often when I talk about this in public, I mean someone would almost certainly put up their hand and say. What about a wealth tax? What about the super wealthy? What about all these billionaires or multi-million millionaires? There's loads of money out there. We don't tax um, wealth terribly well. Um, you're being terribly miserable about all of this. These the, the, these rich people uh, with lots of wealth, they can pay far more tax. So what, 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 Dan, let me start with you. What's your response to that? Yeah, so there was a campaign just last week saying that the world should adopt the Spanish wealth tax. This could raise $2 trillion, they said. What they didn't say was how much the Spanish wealth tax raises. And it's a tax that is beloved of these campaigners because it only applies to the super rich, which was introduced a couple of years ago. I think you have to have three, three million euros before you're affected. How much did it raise? 660 million euros. 0.05% for Spanish GDP. Absolutely nothing. But wealth taxes have a history of dismal failure. And, and why is that? It's because several reasons. One is that the, the political economy, the reality is that you need exemptions in these tax to make them work, and they are ruthlessly exploited. The other is that you're taxing something which is very mobile, very rich people. And the idea that we should copy a tax which anecdotally has had quite significant adverse effects, but on the figures has raised very little, so it seems absolutely nuts to me. Yeah, so I guess to add to that, I mean, just think about economics of tax design kind of with my that hat on. I would prefer tax. I mean, I think we do under tax the returns to wealth. I'd like to affix the taxes that we have on capital gains, dividends and interest and inheritance and all things that kind of flow from wealth. I worry a bit about taxing stocks of wealth because, it, you know, depending on how you do it, you basically end up taxing savings and entrepreneurship in ways that I think are damning. I think there are better ways to do it. And there are practical issues. I mean, don't mention some of them, but also... We don't currently have a wealth tax. We don't measure people's wealth. Measuring some forms of wealth is actually quite difficult. So we need quite a big operation to set up this kind of tax and go out and measure like you know, private companies and stuff. So it wouldn't just be something you can turn on overnight. One idea I think that I'd have more sympathy with is a one-off wealth tax. So if you're sitting there thinking, actually, do you know what? This, historically, this income's been undertaxed and I need a lot of money for whatever reason. Economically, if you can put up a one-off tax, and people genuinely believe it's one-off, like you can really credibly say, we're doing this one-off, we're not going to do it again. And economically, it's fine. It's not going to discourage any investment or savings. And you could raise, you know, chunky sums of money if you just said, take everyone with wealth above a certain level and tax it at a certain percent. The issue there is, is it fair? And there's not a right answer to that. People would have different views on you're retrospectively taxing incomes and it would differ across, you know, depending on how much income you had, how much wealth you had at a point in time. So people would have very different views on that. But but you could do that if you were actually looking. I'd, I'd, I'd be I'd more simply for a one-off wealth tax than I would for a kind of an annual an annual tax. So the, this came out of the Wealth Tax Commission, which was 
I mean, most wealth tax proposals out there are crap promoted by lobby groups who don't think about the consequences for a second. The wealth tax commission was very different. A bunch of very smart people applying some real academic rigor to the history and the practice of wealth taxes. And they concluded ongoing wealth taxes were not a good idea for the reasons we've discussed, but you could have this one-off retrospective tax. And because it's retrospective, you can't avoid it. Because it's retrospective, it doesn't change incentives going forward. Big problem though. Politically, is a government going to create a retrospective tax when they don't have a mandate in their manifesto to do it? And in fact, Rachel Reeves, I know that she quite ruled out wealth taxes, but she she, she, she always close. did. Yeah. So I think it's very hard. There's a bit of a paradox here that for this retrospective wealth tax to work, it has to be unexpected. Otherwise, people will find ways around it. But for it to be viable politically, it probably has to be in a manifesto, which means it is expected. So I think you choose. You have a wealth tax which which doesn't work, or you have a wealth tax that politically can't be done, and neither seem great outcomes. That's a, that's a difficult uh, a difficult um, conundrum. And I, but I think I think generally when I'm asked this, I, my answer is: Look, we've got a bunch of wealth taxes which work really badly at the moment. Let's fix them. Council tax, absolutely catastrophic. Oh, can bad. we talk about council tax? Let's talk about council. Let's talk about the tax. We, we, we haven't got a lot of time. Let's talk about the disaster that is the current taxation system for housing um, and uh, and what we should do uh, to sort that out. Because you could. Um, we, we, one of the things Rachel Reese will also be thinking about, or should, we'll be asking her officials, is what can you do to the tax system to improve economic efficiency and growth? One answer to that is... You know, just start the taxation of housing all over again. But Dan, you wanted to come in on this. Okay, so let's say, as you probably do, Paul, you live in a hundred billion pound um, penthouse. <laughs> in, in oh, the absolutely! West End. H- how much council tax do you pay on that? One thousand nine hundred forty-six pounds thirty-two pence. Let's say that I live in a house in Blackpool. That is a terraced house. It's an exactly average house in Blackpool. How much council tax do I pay? £2,783. A terraced house in Blackpool pays significantly more council tax than a £100 million penthouse in the West End. That is bonkers. I think we could all agree on that. Yep. (laughs) Um, I think I think I think we should be clear. I'm the one that lives in the terrace house, if, <laughs> if, if, <laughs> if not, not in Blackpool. Blackpool. Yeah. Uh, but, um, uh, the uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 we have a crackers council tax um, system, which is regressive in, in within any area, in the sense that you pay a smaller fraction of the value of your house, the more valuable a house, uh, and also very differential across the country, uh, largely down to the. Um, uh, sort of long politics of how the government provides subsidies to different local authorities and provides lots of subsidies to Westminster and not very much to Blackpool relative to their needs. So um, something which is much closer to a proportional uh, tax proportional to the value of your property, which you know, even in that uh, bastion of socialism, Texas and other parts of the United States, they pay far higher taxes on very expensive properties um, than we do here. So that's part of the other. And the other part, I mean, what one tax, if if Rachel Reeve stands up and says she's going to increase stamp duty on housing, I'm I, gonna I, cry. I think I will explode. Um, because <laughs> it's, uh, you know, the... Well, there was already a small stamp duty rise penciled in on her small list of manifesto pledges. I think some oh, foreigners. That that? Oh, some, some foreigners. Um, okay. They're still bad. Even if you're taxing foreigners, it's still bad. The stamp duty is bad regardless of who you're taxing. Um, so yeah, I agree. I, I'm going to be genuinely upset. The idea is to stop foreigners buying houses. Politically, people can say, well, we, 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 that's what we're trying to do. We don't want these foreigners to buy. It should be reserved for, for, for British people. Uh, but that is acknowledging that these taxes stop people buying. And normal stabbed you and normal people absolutely has that effect. What are, what are we doing? Why are we stopping moving house? And there's a danger here, right? Because if you look down, the, I'm looking at the list of taxes here, and we've already talked about lots of them, but there aren't many more on the list, right? So, and we have seen stamp duties go up because people, yeah. when they're paying them, are really angry. But most people, like most of the time, aren't paying them. I don't, I don't see the full effects on how it you know, gums up the housing market. So politically, it might be one of the easier ones to raise, even though it'd be top of our list of like, just do whatever you can. If I'm a chancellor, I'd be deleting it on day one. I just, there's, there's any other way to raise tax almost would be better than that. So, I think, but I think there is a real danger that on budget night we'll be crying, Paul, because we'll be seeing that actually they found half a billion pounds through putting a higher rate of stamp duty, but they need money. I, I, I find that. I find that inconceivable. I can't believe she'd do something so stupid and so damaging. Well, I hope not. Let's hope not. Her predecessors have. I mean, stamp duty is one of those taxes that have gone up enormously over the last 20 years. Yeah, it was the gift that kept on giving, but surely everyone can see now it's at the point where it just 
doesn't, and the incremental increases from raising it have gotten smaller and smaller, and the damage statistically and anecdotally is there to see. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, we're on the same page. Just circling back to council tax very quickly. I mean, obviously, yeah, we've long said that you should we should probably fix council tax. We should revalue it. We should make it proportional. Um, and do other things to it. That's not really going to help growth very much. I think that's really about fairness, right? It's about fairness between different people, like the example that Dan gave us about the terrace houses who are just paying kind of the wrong... Ca- Basically, most people now are in the wrong council tax band and they should absolutely fix that. I suspect... I mean, Rachel Reeves basically said in an interview before the election that she wasn't going to put her political capital into reforming... That wasn't the exact quote, but into reforming council tax. You know, short of a full reform, they could do something like increase the top bands of council tax or um, whack a mansion tax on... Um, lots of technicalities there about how exactly how you do it and council taxes raised locally. So how do you think about how it affects central government revenues is a, is a bit tricky. But but you, you know if if they don't want to do something, but they want to tax property a bit more. They could you know take bans, you know FG and H or and do something at the top. I don't think that would fix all problems, but they could do something like that. And it would be pro growth because you, you, you're encouraging more efficient use of housing stock. Right now there are people owning very very large houses and not living in them. They they, they keep them empty. There's no cost to them from doing that. Once you give them that nudge of a 1%, say, annual charge, suddenly the equation changes. Let, let's, um, we, 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 we need to bring this to a conclusion. Now, I think one thing that is possible that some of our listeners are thinking to themselves is, look, we know that taxes in the UK are at their highest level for a long, long time, highest level ever. But we also know, look across the channel, that taxes in France are much, much higher. Taxes in Germany are much higher. Taxes in Italy are higher. Taxes in Scandinavia are higher. Taxes in the Netherlands are higher, and so on and so on and so on. We're sitting around here saying, it's still terribly difficult. We can't think of any way, any way of increasing uh, ta- you know, taxes um, significantly. But but all these other countries manage to get loads more. So what are we missing? Well, I think raising taxes is really, really easy. It's not difficult. The only thing making it difficult is the political constraints, as we said at the top, right? So if Rachel Reeves hadn't constrained herself and she wanted to raise billions, then look, we spend, I don't know, 70 billion on VAT relief. You could scrap those. Put a few pennies on income tax. You got twenty billion quite quickly. Put a penny, couple of pennies on VAT. You got another ten billion. You could actually quite quickly get lots of billions. So we, it's not that raising tax is difficult. It's that if you say you're not going to raise most of the tax system, then you're scraping around the barrel. That's what's difficult. Um, and think about looking at other countries. I mean, the, the the high level thing about how do other countries do it is. And this is, it doesn't hold everywhere, but you think about like Western European countries. They raise more from social security contributions. And they raise more from average earners. And that's how they that's they're where they stand out. So we don't stand out in that we don't raise enough from the top. We actually raise relatively more from the top relative to the middle than other countries. So if we wanted to be more Western European, we'd uh, have higher taxes on the incomes of average earners. But we, have, we haven't got to do that. We could raise it other ways, but that's how other countries are pulling it off, broadly speaking. Yeah. Every single developed country in the world that spends more on public services than the UK, a higher proportion of GDP spent by the government, raises that money by higher taxes and average earnings than the UK, without exception. There is no country that spends more than the UK without taxing average earners more, not one. And that circles back to what we were saying at the beginning, that uh, you know, that last Tory government, it spent a lot of its time getting more money from the rich and more money from multinationals and actually cut taxes on average earners. And I think the lab- this Labour government is going to feel very constrained to do something similar. Whereas if I were unconstrained by the politics of this and looking around what other other countries um, do and thinking about the efficient way of raising significant tax, if I wanted to raise significant tax, I'd probably stick 5p on the basic rate of income tax. Now, I might not get elected again, um, uh, but that's the that's the sort of world that we're in. And I, I fear, um, really to use the phrase that, that, that Dan did, that we will end up with a series of really quite complicated reforms, uh, which are good for bad people and bad for good people because they're so complicated and create so much difficulty in the tax system because the politicians don't dare do the straightforward things to fund the public services that they, this government says that they want and perhaps the population as a whole say that they want because we have had for decades a, frankly, um, I- I- illiterate and misleading debate about tax. There are lots of people out there who say we need to raise more tax to pay for our public services, but the large majority of them think that someone else will pay that tax, that the rich, the multinationals, or what have you. And we've pushed that quite a long way. There is almost nobody out there saying we need more taxes for public services. And that means you, yes, you, you people on 30, 40, 50,000 a year will actually have to pay a little bit more tax in order to 
uh, in order to achieve it. And that's not something that any politician I can remember saying or be willing, um, being willing to say for reasons that I entirely understand. But if this government really is focused on growth, 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 which the Prime Minister has focused on so much, um, then they're going to find that harder and harder to achieve whilst getting better public services unless they're willing to grasp some of these tax reform nettles. It is depressing. End of rant. I mean, but because we've <laughs> talked about three tax reforms. We, we've talked about income tax, slash insurance tax reform. We've talked about pension tax reform. We've talked about land tax reform, council tax, stamp duty. And I think the three of us believe there is no chance of any of those happening. Uh, what, what's even more depressing to me is that the minor parties, to take, to take the Lib Dems, take the Greens, who have the political space to come out with tax reform proposals, who historically those parties have backed the land value tax during the election campaign, didn't. They just continued with this happy, happy myth that you can raise significantly more tax by not affecting average earners. And it's a lie. Well, on that on that bombshell, sure <laughs> on that bombshell, um, I think uh, we will thank you very much once again for listening to this episode of the IFS Zooms in. Thank you so much to Dan. Thank you so much to to Helen um, this week, and good luck to our Chancellor as she um, doesn't need luck. She just needs to do the sensible thing. <laughs> you're about to finish as she does not raise stamp duty you're going to say yeah. <laughs> well let's wish the chancellor good sense yeah. in that case as she battles with the uh, genuinely difficult really difficult fiscal situation uh, that she has inherited and if she is going to raise significant amounts of revenue in tax well please uh, we, we are, we're always pleased to talk to her about our views about what works um, and what doesn't we've laid out I think lots of ideas as Dan said about sensible reforms to the tax system, uh, which could also raise you um, uh, some more money. We've also talked about things that you really shouldn't do, uh, whether that be um, whether that be stamp duty or uh, simply changing rates of capital gains tax without reforming it um, significantly. Um, we've uh, talked about how other countries uh, raise much more money than we do. We've set out the really difficult political um, trade-offs uh, here. So uh, there is no, no sense in pretending that this is in any way um, straightforward. But let's hope that uh, we have a courageous government who are willing to take some uh, difficult decisions in one direction or another. We, of course, have written, as has Dan, uh, uh, huge amounts uh, on tax and tax reform. If you want to see our work, do please visit www.ifs.org.uk. And to further support us, please do consider becoming a member for as little as £10 a month. You can find out more in the episode description. We will see you next time.